Happy Monday. I was looking at the calendar, and of course, since this class, exams come bang, 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 bang. Uh, and I noticed we have an exam next Wednesday, a week from Wednesday. So just when you thought you were out of the blue, we have another one to think about. <laughs> Made everybody's day with that, I can see. OK. Um, I said we would start with a song. Should we start with a song, or should we put the song in the middle, or should we put the song at the end? You tell me. The middle? Kind of perk up the middle a little bit? OK, but you have to remember back to last lecture for the song. You think you guys can do that? No. <laughs> last lecture was, I can't even remember last lecture. Last lecture was Friday. OK. We will have the song in the middle when everybody starts drooping, which some of you look like you're already doing right now, I should say. So, all right. I'm drooping. I don't know about you guys. All right. Last time, I um, finished up talking about the polymerase chain reaction. And um, I hope that I um, communicated to you the value of that as a tool for amplifying trace amounts of DNA. It's the polymerase chain reaction that's commonly used uh, at crime scenes to um, uh, analyze uh, trace amounts of DNA that are there. And that's benefited largely by um, a uh, technique that we uh, use in uh, identification called DNA fingerprinting. So DNA fingerprinting is a way of using DNA sequence information to um, identify a person. And um, I should point out that with DNA fingerprinting, we're not actually analyzing the sequence, although at some point I suspect that will happen. How many of you have ever seen Gattaca? Yeah, Gattaca is kind of a scary movie in that respect, in that uh, they're using DNA sequence information in a futuristic world that's a bit of a concern. Um, and I thought it was a very well done movie for Hollywood. It was um, uh, something if you haven't uh, seen, I recommend watching. It's kind of an interesting thing. But as we do DNA sequence, as we do uh, DNA fingerprinting, we're not doing sequence analysis. We're actually doing fragment analysis. And um, the fragment analysis is performed on what are called variable repeats that are found in the human genome. <clears throat> and variable repeats are typically fairly short sequences. <clears throat> that are repeated um, numerous times in the genome. They're fairly small, but they are characteristic of an individual. Okay? So just like your DNA sequence is characteristic of you, so too are uh, regions of DNA. And the fragments are easier to analyze than your complete sequence, because to analyze your complete sequence is not a trivial uh, thing to do. Um, what you see on the screen is uh, an analysis of a, the uh, DNA of uh, uh, an individual, uh, or of, of a couple of individuals, where some of the fragments uh, have aligned. And as you can imagine, uh, when you go and analyzing DNA sequences, that uh, you obviously want something that is where no two people have exactly the same pattern of fragments. And so this means some very careful analysis and careful selection of fragments such that they aren't commonly found in the same sizes among uh, people. And these uh, repeated fragments that I have described to you are found randomly enough uh, among a, po a population that we can say with pretty reasonable uh, confidence that they're not repeated within the same two individuals, at least with a chance of about 1 in 20 or more billion. And when we have 3 billion people in the world, the likelihood that two people will have exactly the same fragments um, is pretty minimal. And particularly, two people both involved with the same crime scene, uh, having the same fragments being identical, uh, pretty unlikely. So these variable repeats are very helpful in identifying and flagging uh, individuals. Um, the good news about DNA fingerprinting is that it has been used in, in numerous cases to actually prove that somebody did not uh, commit a crime. There have been people who have been freed as a result of DNA fingerprinting. DNA fingerprinting is one, uh, it's always important to remember, and I say this to, to all of you because some of you may at some point uh, get involved on juries where DNA fingerprinting is uh, used as a consideration. One of the things that happens with DNA fingerprinting is people become convinced that if a DNA fingerprint is there, that that means guilt or whatever. But a DNA fingerprint is really only one piece of evidence in an overall um, uh, scenario. Imagine, if you will, that you were, uh, that there was a crime committed on Monroe Street, and there uh, was something that happened next to a light pole next to the beanery. 
and uh, the police come and they take some samples from that crime scene and they discover that there's some uh, DNA there. And it's later established that that DNA uh, at the crime scene matches your DNA. Um, does that prove that you committed the crime? No, it proves that your DNA was at the crime scene. So proof of a person's guilt or innocence is more than simply the presence or absence of DNA at a crime scene. Uh, we wouldn't say that just because your fingerprint was found on the flagpole next to the beanery, or the light pole next to the beanery, that you committed the crime. It simply meant that at some point you had touched that pole. And so I say that because um, there's a big concern among scientists that people, when they see DNA fingerprinting, take the fingerprint alone as proof of uh, commission of a crime, when in fact the commission of a crime is, uh, the proof of that is a, is a much bigger question. So if you ever serve on a jury uh, where you have DNA evidence, I hope that you will keep that in mind. Okay, um, that said, very briefly, um, I wanted to, uh, and of course you can imagine the same sorts of things are uh, useful for paternity analysis, just like they're useful for um, comparing if the DNA of a suspect is the same as the DNA of the person uh, found on a, on a, a person, uh, find at a crime scene. We could similarly ask the question, could this person be a parent of this child? Uh, most commonly it's used for paternity testing, questioning if this person was the father of the child, although in the cases of uh, babies that have been lost or stolen or mixed up or whatever, that it can be used for the mother uh, as well. And this relies on the fact that um, a child is the, uh, contains the DNA of both the parents. Um, one set of DNAs from the mother, one set of DNAs from the father, and they combine uh, in unique fashions as what you see here. Here's a DNA fragment from, uh, in this case, one parent, the DNA fragment from another parent, and the child which has uh, both uh, of those uh, fragments. Okay. Now, um, I'm not going to talk about DNA sequencing. I think that that's, uh, that lecture is actually a little bit out of date, and I don't think it's really uh, relevant for our purposes. But I do want to say a little bit about microarrays. And yes, question. So uh, what we're looking at is the, the results of a gel that's been run vertically. So we're looking at the results of the comparison of this lane with this lane, but the vertical distribution of those. Yes. So the, the, do they line up vertically or from side to side? So let's, let's go back here. So let, what we would say is um, if we had this kind of analysis, okay, these two fragments, these three fragments, well, actually, these two would clearly be matched. That one actually looks a little bit larger to me. But these two would be matched, these two would be matched, uh, et cetera. If we had a, a perfect match of these three fragments with these three fragments, then that would be one means of identifying uh, a person. Now, I want to emphasize we don't identify people on the basis of three fragments. We typically use uh, DNA analyses that may involve 30 or 40 fragments, and they're from different regions of the genome. So we can say with reasonable confidence that they're not uh, commonly found in the same number of copies in each person. OK. Now, what I want to talk about uh, is uh, a very exciting technology called microarrays. So I talked earlier in the term about um, two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. And I showed you how you could use two-dimensional gel electrophoresis to ask the question, what's the difference in the um, uh, number of uh, proteins or the amount of proteins of a cancer cell versus a normal cell? And that by looking at differences between the proteins of a cancer cell versus a normal cell, we could the proteins it was that were uh, either made in greater amounts in a cancer cell or in lesser amounts in a cancer cell compared to a normal cell. And that might tell us something about how that cancer, or how that cell actually became cancerous. <clears throat> Another technique for analyzing not the protein, but in this case the RNA of a cell, um, is also very powerful and also worth knowing. So I want to tell you a little bit about how it works. So this is a, tech, a technology called microarray analysis. And this one requires a little bit of explanation from me since I don't have any good figures to sh show you about how it works. So let me, excuse me explain to you in words about what we do. What I would like for you to imagine would be to imagine that I've got a little glass slide like you might put on a microscope. Okay? A glass slide like you might put on a microscope. And on that glass slide, I create a grid like a checkerboard 
only with extremely tiny squares, such that I've got thousands, if not millions, of them on that microscope slide. Everybody with me so far? So I've got a grid on a microscope slide, or some whatever size slide we want to we want to define that as, and I've got a grid. And to each one of those squares, I take and chemically synthesize a single-stranded DNA that corresponds to a unique gene. So each square has thousands of identical copies of the same single-stranded DNA that's complementary to that one gene. That's one square. The second square has the same thing for a different gene. A different gene, a different gene, a different gene, a different gene. So that's that each square corresponds to one gene, and each square has a DNA that's complementary to an RNA that codes for that gene. Everybody with me? I know what's on each I know which gene corresponds to each square. Just like in the, in the 2D gel, I knew which spot corresponded to which protein. Here I know which, which square on the grid corresponds to which gene. OK, so I've got my um, um, grid set up. It's called an array. I've got my array set up. All right, and it's just sitting there waiting for the experiment. Let's imagine then that I take a uh, cell or a group of cells, let's say liver cells, and I isolate all of the messenger RNAs from this batch of liver cells. Let's say it's a normal set of liver cells. Okay? I take all those messenger RNAs and I attach to them a red dye molecule. So every messenger RNA that I get from those cells has a red dye. Okay? That's one set of RNAs. Over here, I've got a cancerous liver cell. I go through the same isolation. And this time, when I get all the messenger RNAs, instead of putting a red dye onto each of them, I put a green dye onto each of them. Okay? So I've got a batch of messenger RNAs from the non-cancerous cell that are all marked in red. And I've got a batch of messenger RNAs from a cancerous liver cell that's all marked in green. OK? Everybody with me? So I've got all the RNAs of each of those cells. And then I mix them. Mix them all up. Got all this trouble to keep them separate. Now I'm going to mix them all up. So what I have are red and green displays of everything that's in those cells. Well, then I mix those sequences with the microscope slide. And I allow annealing to occur. Remember, annealing is when, when base pairs can find each other. So what's going to happen is all of those messenger RNAs are going to find their complementary DNA on that grid. Everybody with me? Now, if I have messenger RNAs that are being made only in the normal cell, I will see a spot that corresponds to red, because there won't be any green. And if I have messenger RNAs that are only being made in the cancerous cell, I will only see green. The intensity of the red and the intensity of the green will tell me how much rel on relative amounts is being made. And if I have equal amounts of the two, I will see yellow, because red plus green on a grid gives you yellow. Yes? So the more intense the color is, the more messenger RNA I had from that individual cell. Now you see, when looking at this grid, that there are places where there's no intensity, meaning no, none of that messenger RNA was being made. Other places where there's only red and very intense. Other places where there's red and very faint. Other places where there's green and very intense, and other places where there's green and very faint, and then other places where there's yellow. 
What this is telling me with the messenger RNAs is similar to the information I was getting from the proteins on the two-dimensional gel electrophoresis, because now I can say which messenger RNAs are being made more in the cancer cell compared to the normal cell. And since I know which gene corresponds to which grid spot on there, yes, question? If you have them at the same level, you'll get yellow. You mix equal amounts of red and green, and you will get a yellow spot. Okay. So if I see yellow spots, I say, well, it's being made equally in a cancerous cell and a non-cancerous cell. That's probably not something I'm interested in. But something that's being made in a cancerous cell, like this green spot, it's not being made in the non-cancerous cell, or it wouldn't be green, tells me this is something that helps me to understand, again, how it is that this cell has become cancerous. What genes are involved in the process of making a cancer cell? Jiggling here. Make sense? Could you explain that to me on exam? I see some smiles. That, that, must, that must be a good sign, I hope. Yes, question? Yeah, good question. Is it automatically dispersed? What you do is you sort of smear it across the top. You have it in a liquid solution, OK? And then you allow conditions for what's called annealing, where the complementary base pairs can find each other. And they will find each other on that slide. It's pretty remarkable. OK, so microarrays are very powerful tools to analyze what we call the transcriptome. Okay, You've heard of the genome. The genome is all the DNA. The transcriptome is all the RNA of a cell. You've heard of the proteome. That was all the protein of a cell. So we talked about the genome, the transcriptome, and the proteome. There's a lot of ohms, by the way, more than you want to think about. OK. Well, that's what I want to finish uh, with talking about uh, techniques. I want to turn our attention uh, to talking about the next topic, which is cancer, viruses, oncogenes, blah, blah, blah. I've got a lot of stuff there. OK. Oh, what did I just do? I moved the thing, and I forgot to move the, there we go. I want to spend some time talking about viruses. I'll spend just a little bit of time talking about the immune system, and then I will spend some time talking about cancer. Okay? All right. Well, viruses are very important uh, for obvious uh, reasons. And they're important for us not only from a health perspective, but also from a perspective of being tools that are useful to us. Okay? We can actually use some of the tricks of a virus to help us to do something in a laboratory. We can use some of the tricks of a virus, believe it or not, for medical purposes. Okay? So I'm going to talk about some of those as I go through here. Uh, and I hope that you'll see um, the kinds of things that I'm talking about. All right? Well, let's think about viruses. All right? I like this uh, image here. This is an image of a rotavirus. Um, and viruses um, have a wide variety of shapes and sizes. And they all typically look something like they're, they've got this big, strong front against the world. Don't mess with me, right? Well, this is a really good example. And if you think about it, viruses really have to have this very solid protection against the rest of the world. Cells have a membrane that provides them some kind of a barrier against the rest of the world. And if we're a multicellular organism, that one cell can be buried deep inside of an organism where it doesn't really have to protect too much against the rest of the world that's there. But a virus doesn't have that luxury. A virus spends part of its time infecting a cell, in which case it's relatively protected but most of its time away from the cell, out in the environment, where it gets exposed to all kinds of things. 
So viruses have to have some kind of a shield that protects them, kind of like cells have a shield that protects them. Well, viruses don't have a lipid bilayer, at least typically on their outsides, but viruses do have protein coats. And those protein coats are pretty remarkable. The protein coats are essentially self-assembling. They're essentially self-assembling. This guy can pretty much, it's like a puzzle putting itself together. That's what self-assembly is about. Okay? Thinking about how these kinds of processes can happen really is a pretty cool thing. Viruses contain within them nucleic acid. The form of that nucleic acid can vary from one virus to another enormously. Some viruses have double-stranded DNA. That's pretty common. Some viruses have single-stranded DNA. Some viruses have single-stranded RNA. And some viruses have double-stranded RNA. So we see single and double-stranded versions of both DNA and RNA within a virus, depending on the virus. In every case, for the virus to go through its life cycle, the virus has to be able to inject its nucleic acid into a target cell. That's an essential part of a viral life cycle, is injecting its nucleic acid into a target cell. How does a virus know what's a target cell? Well, I'll tell you something that may surprise you, it surprises a lot of people, is that most viruses don't work in every cell. In fact, there's no virus that works in every cell. But viruses will be fairly specific for the types of cells that they will infect. If a virus randomly attaches to any cell and injects its nucleic acid, then the virus is likely not to be a very effective virus because if the viral nucleic acid gets inside and it can't replicate or it can't make proteins because it doesn't have the right sequences for that cell, then that virus is taken out of the loop. So one of the ways in which viruses ensure that they're being efficient in their infection is that they will typically recognize and attach to a specific protein or structure on a, cell, on a target cell's surface. That helps them ensure that they're infecting a cell that they're capable of replicating in. Some of these guys on the surface here are involved in that recognition process where they're recognizing specific structures on a target cell that are found only on that target cell. You might start to think, well, if I can block a virus's recognition of a target cell, maybe I can stop the infectious cycle of a virus, and that's actually used in some strategies. It's actually one of the strategies that um, people have talked about using for HIV. Okay. Stopping the spread of HIV by stopping its ability to interact with a target protein on the surface of a human cell. There's some more beautiful ones there. That's an interpretive drawing, by the way. That's not an actual virus in the middle. And they come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. This is uh, actually an RNA virus right here. Okay. The middle one that I showed you, I didn't say a word about it, is adenovirus. Adenovirus is, is actually the virus I study. I got my PhD studying. And adenovirus is a double-stranded DNA virus. And it's very interesting because it's, it's one of the few viruses in um, um, eukaryotic cells that is a linear double-stranded DNA. What did we learn about linear DNAs in eukaryotic cells? What happens to them? They shorten every time they replicate, right? Well, you can imagine viruses which are much, much smaller than the genome. How do they survive that shortening? Well, it turns out they don't. They don't shorten, that is. 
adenovirus was interesting. The reason we were studying it when I was a graduate student was because we were interested in understanding how it was that linear DNAs got replicated. And that time, when I was a graduate student, was long before we knew that, they, that chromosomes shortened. But what we did know about the adenovirus was very interesting because at the five prime end of each strand of the double-stranded DNA, there was a protein called terminal protein. A protein was physically attached to the end. We wondered, what was that protein? Might it have some role in the replication? Well, it turns out that the terminal protein did have a role. And it was that protein that helped the initiation process to occur so that the shortening that we now know occurs in uh, our chromosomes doesn't occur uh, in the virus itself. Adenovirus, I'll mention uh, a little bit later, is very useful uh, in some cases for um, introducing DNA into human cells. And I'll talk about that later. OK. Um, there are some DNA-containing uh, viruses that you can see there. And no, I'm not showing you this, so I'll give you something to memorize, but just showing you that there are some different uh, viruses. Viruses, of, uh, viruses in human cells can range from very small a few thousand base pairs in size, to uh, fairly large, a few hundred thousand base pairs uh, in size. And if you think about it, those nucleic acids that are part of the virus are being injected for a purpose, and they're being injected because they contain information necessary to make the virus. That information includes, at a very minimum, the way to replicate the virus and the way to package it up once it gets replicated, that is, the protein coat that's necessary for it. It may have other factors as well. And I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about those uh, later. Okay, There are some RNA viruses. Uh, you see viruses like measles and mumps are RNA viruses. Uh, the flu virus is an RNA virus uh, right here. Uh, some really nasty stuff that are RNA viruses, yellow fever, encephalitis. Um, encephalitis, et cetera. HIV is an RNA virus. Retroviruses we kind of put in a, a category by themselves, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So schematically, when we think about the life cycle of a virus, I've already talked about just a little bit of it, but I want to say some more uh, about it uh, right here. Okay? So this fairly well depicts what a virus has to do during its life cycle. And the question about whether a virus is alive or not is really a semantic argument. Okay? If, you, if by, by alive you mean its ability to completely do its own replication, then a virus is not alive. But if you're talking about its ability to replicate per se, then a virus is alive. So you can argue about whether that means it's alive or not. It's a semantic argument, not a real argument. Okay. Well, here's the life cycle of a virus. We see a virus uh, out here with its nucleic acid. It uh, looks like a double-stranded virus there uh, that is uh, encased in a protein. And we can see these little spicules that are sticking out that will allow it to interact with a target protein or a target structure on the uh, target cell. Once uh, that interaction occurs, the uh, virus will inject its nucleic acid into the cell. And when the virus gets into the cell, the viral nucleic acid gets into the cell, um, it must go through several processes. At a very minimum, it will need to be transcribed, meaning that it will need to uh, uh, copy the messenger RNA for the genes that code for the virus. It will need to replicate, because again, if it's going to make copies of itself, replication is pretty essential. Those messenger RNAs uh, from the viral nucleic acid will need to be translated to turn them into protein. And then finally, there has to be a phase where the proteins that have been made for the virus, which make up the coat of the virus, have to be combined with the nucleic acid, which has been replicating, so that we make a finished viral particle. And this is a very much a self-assembly kind of a process. And then finally, after a period of time, these viruses get so numerous and so abundant that the cell bursts open. And when it bursts open, the viral particles escape from the cell. And you can see them escaping out here. There are various strategies for blocking several of these processes within the viral genome. There are strategies, as I said, for HIV for blocking entry at this point. 
There are, uh, in the case of HIV, numerous uh, things that are used to block the replication of the virus, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. And last, on the virus, uh, in, in treating HIV, there are um, what are called protease inhibitors that block the finishing of this viral particle. And so working at all of those levels, one hopes to reduce the replication and the abundance of HIV. And as a result of the actions of drugs that we have designed that accomplish these various goals that I've described to you here, the HIV level in the body of a, of a person who has been infected with HIV can be reduced to essentially zero, okay, so long as they're taking those drugs. Okay? Now, it's never exactly zero, so that's why ha we have caution with HIV and so forth. But the result of that has meant that we have changed the lives of many people as a result of those actions. Okay, let me say a word about the HIV life cycle, and then um, since you're starting to look a little droopy, we'll sing a song. Is that cool? Or should we sing the song first? Go for it? Okay, that's what my inclination is to. Well, HIV um, is an interesting um, virus. This is what we know um, about the virus. You can see it's uh, structure uh, of various uh, proteins, and these are various proteins that are involved in uh, the cellular uh, structure, as you can, and I'm sorry, in the viral structure, as you can see here. Some of these uh, involve, like GP120, involve interacting with cellular structures for that infection process that I was talking about. We can see within here that the virus uh, actually has uh, a, um, um, a viral RNA that uh, is the coding uh, for the information of the virus. HIV is an example of a retrovirus, and a retrovirus is a virus that uh, has a, an RNA genome that must be copied backwards into DNA. That's a reverse transcriptase that makes that happen. And then that DNA has a couple of possible fates, as we shall see. This is what the virus looks like. Okay. The life cycle of HIV is that the viral RNA has, in this case, already gotten into the cell. So we've had the injection phase where the viral RNA uh, is there. The viral RNA it contains coding for several genes. Those genes include proteins that are necessary to make the viral particle. It also includes some enzymes that are essential for the viral life cycle. One of those enzymes is the replication uh, molecule, or the replication enzyme, known as reverse transcriptase. I've mentioned it before. And reverse transcriptase converts single-stranded RNA into double-stranded DNA. Okay? And that's what you see going on right here, converting single-stranded RNA into double-stranded DNA. These LTRs here are called long terminal repeats, and they're just repeated sequences at the end of the DNA. I won't say anything more about those. That double-stranded DNA can have a couple of fates. One is that transcription off of it can occur, meaning an RNA polymerase can come and say, oh, there's a gene here. I'm going to copy it and make messenger RNAs. That's one thing that can happen. A more common thing that will happen is that the double-stranded DNA will be target for another enzyme coded, by the, coded for by the virus called integrase. Integrase, I-N-T-E-G-R-A-S-E. -E. Integrase, and this is the really bad part of the virus, integrase will catalyze the opening of a cellular chromosome and the insertion of that double-stranded viral DNA. So it's like taking, making a break in the DNA strand and inserting in that break the double-stranded viral DNA. This is why retroviruses in general, and HIV in particular, is so insidious and is something that you're probably not easily ever going to get rid of. 
Because once it is inserted into the chromosome, it's a part of your genome. And every time that cell that has had this happen replicates, that HIV DNA is going with it. Well, that HIV DNA has promoters in it, and those promoters lead to transcription. And what do transcription lead to? RNA, just like up here. And this cycle can go on and on and on and on. As I noted, we tackle the virus in several ways by both attacking its ability to infect, its ability to um, uh, transcribe, its ability to replicate. I, sh I shouldn't say transcribe. We don't stop its ability to transcribe. But its ability to infect, its ability to replicate, and its ability to package. Okay. Now, there are some very sophisticated techniques that people have described recently that they're hopeful of someday being able to cut out specifically the HIV DNA of an infected person. Okay? Probably a long ways away from actually realizing that, because as you can imagine, a person who's infected doesn't have just one cell infected, but billions of cells infected. And making sure that it works exactly in each of those uh, cells would be a problem. But there are some strategies for doing that that's, that's promising. Questions about this? Yes? Yeah, good question. So uh, in a standard virus, when the um, uh, viruses erupt or burst forth from the cell, do they kill the cell? Yes, they typically do. Okay, how about a song? So this song is about restriction enzymes. It's to the tune of Chim Chim Cheri. Everybody, remember, anybody know that, that song from, yeah, Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins, yes. Okay, well, I hope you'll sing it with me because I can't sing the song itself very well. I'm, a, I'm obsessed with AAGCTT because it's the binding site of Hindi 3. Cutting up DNA most readily. The ends are not blunt when they're cut up, you see. Five prime overhangs of AGCT. Bacteria don't have an immune system, so they must fight off phages or they will not grow. Protection by chopping is their strategy, and one of the cutters we call Hindi 3. On binding to AAGCTT, the site recognition site's bent easily. Phosphodiester attacking, meanwhile, has water behaving as nucleophile to stave off the phage for a little while. Why don't these enzymes cut cell DNAs? The answer's provided by amethylase. Adding a methyl group on top of what? This sequence, these enzymes would otherwise cut. So cells get protected in this simple way from nuclease chewing of their DNA. The phage is not lucky in most every case unless methylases win the enzyme race. If that happens, then the cell gets erased. My voice is, is breaking. <laughs> OK, nothing new there. All right. I can see you're really interested in this lecture, aren't you? <laughs> I'll tell you what. I didn't pick out a second song, but if you're really nice, I will pick out a, second, uh, a, a general song at the very end. How's that? I always aim to please. OK. But you've got to pay attention for the rest of what I'm saying. <laughs> OK. So this figure shows uh, the simplicity of HIV. OK. This virus only has a few genes. It only has a few genes. It doesn't have very many. I've mentioned a couple of them, reverse transcriptase being one. It has an integrase, which allows it to do that integration that I described. It has some protein coats, and it has a few uh, proteins that go in the coat, and a couple of others, but that's about it. It says that the complexity of a virus is unrelated to the damage that it might cause. 
The complexity of a virus is unrelated to the damage it might cause. There are things, I can pick up, there are things that infect plants called viroids. They're little tiny fragments of nucleic acid, very, very simple, but they cause a lot of havoc. Again, reiterating that the complexity of the virus is unrelated to the damage it may cause. Okay. Now, I said we might use viruses as a means of treating human disease, improving human health. And I've just given you, yes, question, Daria. Um, why are you well, I'm sorry, say it again. The plant virus that you can oh, the plant virus, I just mentioned, it's called, it's called a viroid, V-I-R-O-I-D. They're little simple nucleic acids that cause a lot of problems in plants. What you see on the screen here is a strategy for using the techniques of a retrovirus to alter a cell's genome. Now, this is actually getting to be a little old. There are some newer strategies people have, but I, this is a fairly easy one to understand based on what I've told you so far about retroviruses. Okay? The other strategies are more involved, and we won't have the time to go into them here. What does a retrovirus do? Well, all retroviruses have the basic features that I described for you about HIV. They have a reverse transcriptase. They have an integrase-like protein that allows it to insert DNA into a genome. Okay? So perhaps we can use that ability of a retrovirus to insert DNA into a genome to correct a genetic defect within that genome. Okay? And that's part of what's here. That's part of what's here. Okay? Let's imagine, if you will, that um, I am a person who has cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease caused by a fairly simple mutation, but the effects of that mutation are pretty drastic. People who have cystic fibrosis uh, have a lot of problems with their lungs, with phlegm, and other uh, organs uh, to a lesser extent. They uh, not uncommonly um, uh, may die of that disease before they're 30 years old. Okay? Uh, so it's a very uh, nasty disease, and it's caused by a fairly simple mutation in a gene that they have. What if you could fix that gene? If you could fix that gene, you could transform that person's life. You could give that person the ability to uh, live a normal life of a normal life expectancy. So there's a lot of interest in uh, the scientific world about ultimately, and we're not talking about doing this anytime soon, but ultimately curing genetic disease by being able to insert DNAs to correct problems that have arisen as a result of mutation. Okay. Well, this strategy that, that's on the screen is one way of doing that. It's not probably going to be used because it's not as targeted as we would like it to be. But I'll show it to you nonetheless. If I have the gene, the correct gene for uh, cystic, that, that, that's involved in cystic fibrosis, and I put it into a disabled retrovirus. A disabled retrovirus means it's able to do the insertion phase really good, but not so good to do all the other phases. What I can do is take that modified virus that has the corrected gene, which is what I have uh, here, okay, and I package it up into this retrovirus particle, and the retrovirus provides me a very efficient way of injecting nucleic acid into a target cell. And not just one target cell, but millions of target cells. Because if I'm going to alter the genome, I can't just alter one cell and expect that everything's going to be OK. I have to target millions, billions, maybe every cell of the organism. So that means I have to be efficient in the delivery of the nucleic acid. Packaging it into a retrovirus is a very good way to do that, because the retrovirus is already set up to insert nucleic acid into target cells. Okay? 
Remember when I said we had techniques for introducing DNAs into cells and it was about 1 in 10,000? All right? A virus does it essentially every one that it comes in contact with. Okay? So the retrovirus provides us a way of inserting the DNA. The integrase that would go with it allows the viral DNA that gets made, which now contains the proper gene, to insert into the genome of a target cell. And now that target cell, which previously had only defective, mutated gene, now would contain in its genome the corrected gene. Sounds great. It's actually been tried, and it's been stopped. Okay? It's been used to treat various uh, diseases in children. It was tried in, in some children for some diseases that could not otherwise be treated. And at first, it looked extraordinarily promising because it gave the children relief from the, whatever the disease was that they were suffering from. But what they found over time was that several of the children came down with unusual cancers. And the unfortunate part of this strategy is that the insertion that happens into the genome is typically not specific for a specific place. So we can think of the insertion as being random. And if we interrupt a critical gene that protects against cancer, like P53, we might expect that cell that had that insertion might have some problems. And that's one of the things that's happened with that. So more precise techniques are needed if we're going to deploy this at um, a reasonable level. Questions about that? Quiet group. Should we sing a so another song? OK. Let me see what I can come up with. Um, how about, what's that? What, what, what? Oh, my picture. Oh, <laughs> ugly guy, yeah. Um, how about, um, I have over 200. You pick a song, you tell me. How, okay, I'll tell you what. How about down here? Student experience. How about. BB, you're the shits, okay? <laughs> this is the two of the old uh, TV show called Green Acres, and it goes 450 is the course for me with all its biochemistry. I soak up what this course provides. Structure and function and info about peptides. Do, 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 do. 450 was the choice for me. Molecular biology. I love the way it gets risque. Exposing the face inside the DNA. Da, 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 Enzymes. Da, 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 da. Five primes. Da, 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 da. Histones. Da, 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 da. The clones. This is terrible. You know, if you don't know the song, <laughs> a battle of wits, as good as it gets. Oh, BB, you're the shit. <laughs> you know, I have never sung that song in front of a class before. <laughs> and you can probably tell, that's awful. Okay, thank you.